Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Gordon Current Science and Technology stage. My name is Susan, I'm an educator here at the museum. And today's Science Snapshot presentation is about building with biology. And this also has to do with some things you might have heard of, synthetic biology, genetic engineering, biological engineering. Most of these phrases, they essentially mean the same thing. There might be some small nuances between them, and I'll be using them somewhat interchangeably. Um, but if you're curious about some of the nuances after the show, I can talk about that a little bit as well. But we're going to talk about what it means to build with biology, um, exactly what that means. We'll talk a little bit about some uh, examples about what you can genetically engineer or build with biology. And then finally, I'll give a real world example where there's a few different ways that biological engineering has been used to try and solve a real world problem. So first off, biologists are scientists that study living things. Might not be a surprise to you. Engineers solve specific problems. Not that biologists don't solve specific problems, uh, but if you put the two together, you actually get a biological engineer who's solving specific problems by using living organisms. And so a lot of times you think of an engineer as using a toolbox and tools. Well, biological engineers use a toolbox and tools that's actually filled with biological things. But they also use the engineering design cycle, which very simply put is once you come up with an idea, you design something that you would like to then build, you build that, you test it, and then there's often an iteration where after you test it, you have to change something to make it better or improve upon it. And then you test that. And then you keep going around this cycle until you get whatever your final result is. And it's often an innovation upon the first thing that you were trying to improve. Or it might be that you were trying to make something faster, or do it cheaper, or make more of it, or make it better. And so you keep going through this cycle until you reach your final solution. Now, it's difficult to actually track the growing field of biological engineering. 10 years ago, there were not many people doing this, and they might not have even identified themselves as biological engineers. But there's a competition called iGEM, which is based on biological engineering. And as that's grown, we can kind of use that as a correlation to how the field has grown. So iGEM is the International Genetically Engineered Machine, and it's a competition that's held in Boston every year. In 2004, it started at MIT with five teams and a few dozen individuals, uh, mostly undergraduates, competing. Then, over the next few years, you can see it's drastically increased until last year, the 2014 iGEM competition uh, had over 250 teams and over 10,000 participants in it, and they've since moved to the Heinz Convention Center where they can fit everyone in it. So this is just an example how the field has grown dramatically over the past 10 years. Now, the iGEM competitors are all competing for the coveted bio brick. And it's clever for a number of reasons. One, engineers might often use bricks to build things, and so they use the Lego brick. Legos are a really good uh, model to use in trying to build things. But it's called the bio brick because they're talking about the biological bricks that they use in order to solve their problems. In iGEM, they have to pick, they have uh, teams from 37 countries around the world, and they have to pick an issue that's local to them that they want to solve by using their biological toolbox. And so each participant in iGEM gets a simple cardboard box, and in it has dozens of tubes, test tubes, little tubes, maybe some dishes that hold pieces of DNA, that hold proteins. They use things like yeast or bacteria as their organisms that they then put the DNA in to try and make a completely new organism that can solve that specific problem that they're working on. So very simply, what they might do with a piece of DNA or even the information about that piece of DNA is take that new piece of DNA, put it into an organism's DNA. Again, yeast and bacteria are preferred ones, but you can use virtually any type of organism, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So you cut that organism's DNA, put in the new DNA, and you get engineered DNA. 
And that engineered DNA in that organism is going to do whatever that new piece of DNA tells it to do. So for example, when we think of engineered organisms, one phrase that's often used are GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Now, what do you normally think of if I say GMO to you? What comes to mind? What thing, hmm? Food, yeah, a lot of times we think of foods and there's a lot of issues going on right now about whether or not GMO foods should be labeled or not. I'm not gonna get into that discussion here, but I wanted to point out what that means to be a genetically modified organism in many cases. So one great example is looking at the papaya. Anyone here like papayas? So this is my papaya that I bring around once a week. I try and get a new one so it doesn't get gross. I have to buy a, a model one at some point. So the papaya has actually been affected by a blight, a virus that's wiping out papaya groves all over the world. And so I'll talk specifically about Hawaii. That's the one I know the most about. The only papayas that are grown in Hawaii now have been genetically modified in order to boost their immune system. So something in their DNA has been changed. That allows their immune system to be that much more pumped up. So when they come in contact with this virus that's wiping out papayas everywhere, the papaya can fight off the virus and survive. So papaya grows are being wiped out all over, all over Hawaii. All of the papayas that you get from Hawaii now, every single one of them is genetically modified. And this is true of um, other papayas around the world. It was a group in Hawaii, an academic group in Hawaii, that came up with these engineered papayas. They gave the seeds out to the farmers all over Hawaii, supposedly for free, and that's now what you're getting if you're getting your papaya from Hawaii. Now the only thing that it does is enhance its immune system so it fights off the virus. But that's just one example and type of a genetically modified organism. I keep mentioning things like yeast and bacteria. And I like to think of yeast and bacteria as tiny little factories. Because you can put a new piece of DNA into, let's say, a type of yeast. This is regular baker's yeast that you might use for bread. And in this specific example, they actually put in something that makes beta carotene in the yeast. Beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A. And so if people then baked bread using this yeast, they'd have a lot more beta carotene in it. It actually comes out as orange bread. And that increases the amount of vitamin A that they can get in their system. Now, most people here in the United States can take a vitamin in order to do that, just a pill or something. But people all over the world, if they could have access to this type of yeast, they can boost their vitamin A. And so that's one example of getting an extra piece from that organism. But that's still something that you ingest. So I want to get an even more specific about a product that can be used and is used by people from a genetically modified type of yeast. So diabetes is a disease where either the person can't make enough insulin um, or they're not able to, pr or to use the insulin that they make. Insulin is needed to process sugar in our bodies. And so those people that can't make or use their own will often get insulin injections or supplements from it. And so uh, for the longest time, they were using insulin from cows and pigs. But what if you could use human insulin? They put the information to make human insulin in yeast. The yeast then cranks out insulin. It's exactly the same and identical to human insulin that other people would actually make in their bodies. And that's what most diabetics now, when they take insulin injections, it's usually human insulin that comes from yeast. So this is an example where the product that comes out is exactly the same as the natural product that would occur. We're just making it in little tiny little yeast factories. Another example, and there's lots of different examples and types um, of genetically modified organisms, but this is another really interesting one where you use bacteria as a sensor. Biological organisms are often much more sensitive at being able to de detect changes in their environment than, let's say, electronics can. And so in one case, they've taken bacteria, and when it interacts with cyanide, it glows green. So what you could do if you have a body of water, a lake, a river, a stream, that you want to check for contaminants. You just take maybe a cup of water out of there, have your bacteria, add your bacteria into that water. If there's cyanide in it, that bacteria will start to grow green. You'll see the water start to grow, glow green, and you'll realize there'll be cyanide inside of it, a very sensitive biological sensor of bacteria. 
So that's just another example of genetically modified organisms. They're not all the food ones um, that you might check out in your supermarket, but there's a lot of other uses for them as well. Now I want to get into the real world problem I talked about where scientists from all different types of scientists all over the world are trying multiple uh, solutions to try and mitigate the problem that is malaria. Now malaria, uh, there's over 200 million cases of malaria every year. Uh, about half a million people die each year from malaria and most of those are children under the age of five that are living in Africa. And so there are chemists, there are biologists, there are uh, social workers, there are engineers, all trying to work on this particular problem. And I'll give you some uh, other solutions they've come up with and then some of the biological engineering ones. Okay. So first of all, malaria is something caused by a parasite. It is not a bacteria or a virus. It's a cell, small organism, but it's a parasite. That parasite, once it's inside of a mosquito, the mosquito can bite a human, transmit it to the human, that can cause a blood infection, malaria, and then when another mosquito bites that person, they can pick up the parasite from them, they can bite another person and transmit it, and on and on, and this is the malaria cycle. And so there's a lot of different places in this cycle that they can try and stop this. So some of the most simple solutions are doing things like using insecticide sprays to kill the mosquitoes in the area that might transmit it, using mosquito nets to try and protect the people around them, and that has tremendously helped in the past few decades. But there's issues with using insecticides, uh, and mosquito netting is not always foolproof. And so there's been other attempts at other solutions as well. There also is an anti-malarial drug. There's several of them. One of the best ones is something called artemisinin, or an artemisinin-based therapy. Now, artemisinin comes from the wormwood plant, and there are about 50,000 to 100,000 farmers all around the world that grow the wormwood specifically to produce the artemisinin product here and give it to pharmaceutical companies to treat malaria. Now, the normal process behind this is to grow fields and fields of the wormwood and then to extract the artemisinin, send that off to the pharmaceuticals. This takes anywhere from just over a year to a year and a half. And that's from, you know, planting them, growing them, extracting them, um, and having the final chemical product. However, scientists can now take yeast, take the information needed to make that fairly simple looking molecule, put that molecule into the yeast, or the information into the yeast, and coming out of the yeast, they can make the exact same molecule. It's identical. In the end, you're left with the identical thing. This time, it only takes weeks. They can make 70 million doses from the engineered yeast in the same amount of time and effort that it, from a single lab compared to the 70,000 doses that could be made from what we currently have um, from farmers producing it throughout the year. So this would make it faster from instead of months or years, it would take weeks. It's cheaper because it's all grown up in a single lab instead of an entire farm. Um, and you can get more of it. So this seems like an excellent solution to be making an anti-malarial drug. So are there any other considerations, though? Is there anything we need to take into account? Because I would say almost more so than any other scientific area, biological engineers are extremely concerned with uh, understanding how the public feels about the type of science that they're doing. In some cases, when you're manufacturing a drug, they often make the drug, put it out there, and then see if the consumers will then use it. But in this case, they want to know before they make their product how the public feels about their use. They're very concerned with the court of public opinion. So what do you think? Are there other considerations that you want to keep in mind, even though we're making something faster, cheaper, or more? Is there anything we want to take into account? This is actually a huge area of debate around the world about why not everyone thinks it's a good idea to use the yeast. Can you think of anything, Why? So what about the 100,000 farmers that actually grow the artemisinin? Some people have just offhanded say, well, yeah, tell them to grow potatoes or something instead. But that's not always a very viable option due to soil, environment, product, demand, lots of reasons. 
So potentially, if all artemisinin comes from a lab and none from farmers, that's upwards of half a million people that then lose their livelihood. So this is a concern that the genetic engineers want to make sure that they're going to maximize those benefits for the world as a whole, but minimize any of the negative effects, specifically for the groups uh, most drastically affected. So another uh, way in mitigating malaria transmission is, once again, to try and uh, do something with the mosquitoes themselves. Get rid of the mosquitoes or preventing them from biting humans. One thing they can do is affect a mosquito's sense of smell or direction. And basically, mosquitoes smell humans. That's how they find them and then bite them. So they can make a change with that. They can also make females that don't fly. So they can change something in the population and in the mosquitoes where the females aren't able to fly. Females are the ones that bite. If the females can't bite, if they can't fly, they can't find humans, they can't bite. But then the female population will, if they don't survive, if they don't get food, that could potentially wipe out the whole mosquito population. Then they can also make sterile males. And what they can do is make uh, males in the laboratory make them sterile, and then release them into the wild. Again, that would potentially wipe out a whole population. So we've got our mosquito here, and we know what parts of the DNA, there might be a couple different parts in, our, in their DNA that is what's responsible for reproduction. So what they could do is change one of those pieces of DNA in there, and then release them into the wild. If those wild, sterile males mate with the females, the females won't be able to lay eggs, you won't be able to continue on with the mosquito population, and the ones that are uh, transmitting the disease are gone. Does anyone have any problems with this? Personally, if you've been camping any time this summer, I personally have a couple weekends ago, and I say, wipe them all out. I hate mosquitoes. Get rid of them. I have bug bites all over my legs. But is there any reason maybe we shouldn't wipe out an entire mosquito population? Bats, yes, bats, the other animals that eat them. Yep, there's our bat over there. So what about the environment? So yes, mosquitoes do bite humans, and that's really annoying and all, but mosquitoes are responsible for being a really key member of the food web in many different environments. All the insects and animals that feed on the mosquitoes, well, if they lose their food source, then that could damage them. And then all the animals that feed on them, that could completely bring down an entire food web system here. Now, some scientists have also uh, brought up the fact that there are 3,000 species of mosquitoes around the world, and only 40 of them transmit disease. And that includes malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, all the different ones. So some scientists would argue, and I might argue as well, well, then get rid of those 40 mosquitoes. But you don't know what specific effects it's going to have on the specific environment that those mosquitoes are living in. And so there's been a lot of talk about releasing these mosquitoes um, in Florida. They've done that in order to get rid of a dengue fever outbreak there and in other places around the world. But people definitely have concerns about that. Another example that they're using is what if they could kill the parasite before it gets to the person? So what if they could kill the parasite in the mosquito? So another thing they're working on doing, and this is a little bit harder, is taking DNA or information that uh, would be able to make something that kills the parasites. So you'd have the mosquito DNA there on the bottom, and you'd have that new DNA, that new information inserted in there, and then that DNA would get put into the mosquito population. Once in the mosquito population, inside of the mosquitoes themselves, maybe inside their stomachs, it would make this protein or this drug that would kill the parasite when it was inside of it. So a mosquito might uh, bite a person that's infected with malaria. You got your little parasites there. And when they sucked up the parasites, before they transmitted it to another person, well, those, that little drug, those little proteins in there could kill the parasite. And then, you know, you still have the issue of the mosquito going around and biting people, but now it's not actually transmitting malaria. So this is another type of mosquito that they're working on genetically engineering and potentially releasing into the wild. So now we're just wiping out the parasite and not necessarily the mosquito population. Do you have any concerns with this one? Yeah, what's one of your... 
Oh, resistant parasites, that's excellent. Yep, resistant parasites, what happens, and you have to deal with uh, what happens next. Malaria, the parasites have been notoriously difficult to treat, and we don't know what can that have, what kind of effect would that have when a mosquito bites a person? You know, are they gonna give us that protein that's inside of them back to us? What effects does that have on humans? So there's a lot of issues back and forth that genetic engineers are need to take into account before they can, for example, release something into the wild. So there's a lot of different problems that are being solved with genetic engineering. I mentioned a few. They've made glowing plants to act as street lights instead of using electricity. Um, we talked about different types of fruits, making different types of detergents and sensors. So there's a lot of problems out there, and pretty much any problem you can think of, genetic engineers are working on a way to biologically engineer something to try and solve that particular issue. So what problem would you solve by building with biology? I'll leave you with that. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to come on up. Otherwise, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day here at the museum.